We're going to be focusing on technology in the classroom. Um, for years, it's been, actually for centuries, it's been all about reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think we have a couple of uh, new, new themes that are going to be emerging in the classroom related to technology. I'll introduce my, pa my panelists in just a moment. My name is Roshana Bide. I run Global Talent for Bloomberg Engineering. So that really is focused on bringing the right talent in um, for our 6,000 software and infrastructure engineers, and then, of course, making them successful. So we are always about looking at the most critical skills in technology and, of course, the interplay between schools and what we can do from the education side. So um, joining me on stage is Jessica Lindell. She is Global Head of Education at Unity Technologies. We also have John Rochelle. He is the director of Google's Education Apps Group. And we have Mike Milken, who is the chairman and founder of the Milken Institute. All three of my panelists will be talking about uh, the future of tech. And when we talk about this topic, there's really two ways we can look at it. The first is how we look at technology in the classroom as a learning tool. So how can we look at VR, AR, coding um, as a learning tool? The other way to look at it, which is what we'll be focusing on on our panel, is preparing students at the K through 12 um, and even into college for the critical tech skills for the future of work, for jobs that might not even exist today. So Jessica, kick us off. Talk a little bit about Unity Technologies and what it is that you are doing in this space. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great to see lots of familiar faces in the room. Uh, Unity Technologies, if you're, if you're not aware, is the largest real-time 3D development platform. We have millions of creators who create operate and monetize their experiences on over three billion devices globally. And as we all know, there's creators everywhere, uh, but economic opportunity is not everywhere. So what we decided to do a few years ago was provide all of our professional licenses for free to all educators and students, about a $1,500 per user value, and have distributed over half a million of these in the last year, as well as all of the lesson plans and curriculum and materials that go along with it, really to lower the barriers to entry and provide to all of these young people access to future 21st century jobs. So let's say, you've set the stage really nicely, and we'll get into the technology in a moment, but one thing that just strikes me is that you're, you're providing this for free. So talk a little bit, and maybe Mike, we can go to you, talk a little bit about, um, take us back even to 1993 and some of the origins of the programs and what it is that you're trying to do to make technology and education to technology accessible. Well, if I take you back to the 70s, we could focus <laughs> on some of the things uh, we've learned, but I think the first thing, um, I want to relate to is uh, Unity Technologies and Google in the early days didn't exist. The sheer fact they exist, I'm going to check on Unity the second we leave the panel on how we can use it. But um, let's start with math. The highest paid jobs in this country today are math related. And so our view was could we make math fun? And, and we discovered over a period of time with this program going into the lower uh, socioeconomic areas that we could make math fun by giving children uh, confidence. And the question was, can you change a person's life forever if you only have an hour with them or an hour and a half? In an hour, hour and a half, how can you change their life forever? So we often searched out the weakest students in the school uh, we gave them special powers, multiplying numbers in their head faster in a calculator, then had competitions in the classroom, gave the smartest kids calculators, and these kids who they thought were the weakest uh, could multiply numbers in their head faster than a calculator. Overnight, you change the entire relationship between these kids and the other kids in the class. Were they really geniuses? And they just were bored what happened, and we give them additional special powers over a period of time. So I think self-confidence and in this type of environment and finding practical uses uh, has been something we focused on for many decades here. And today many of those, quote, class dunces are teachers, math teachers, and other things uh, today a generation later. And we found all kids like to compete, like to succeed. And so finding ways that they can link success. Um, if I go to later in life high school, uh, we created an opportunity for 
incoming MBA students to interact with 11th graders in also socially, economic depressed areas. And they had to go into business. They had to form a company. We provided capital to them in numerous cities. And 100% of our students graduated high school. Uh, and many of them today have companies that exist that were formed when they were 11th graders. So it's interesting. I was with a group of these uh, students that are now, as I say, the oldest group would be uh, 48. And they told, and the biggest issue, and I would say the majority at this time were African Americans, were talking to us, what are their biggest problems? The biggest problem is the work ethic of their kids. So it was an, <laughs> it was an interesting thing to see uh, from that standpoint. But the success in their micro businesses and teaming up with MBA students really changed their perspective in life. Well, and you've talked a little bit even just now about collaboration and, um, and the skills that are needed. John, I'd like to ask you, what are the skills that are needed? Is it purely tech? I mean, should we be looking at VR, AR, data mining? Um, is there more? Yeah, there's way more. And, and I think the best way to describe it is that tech is really the tool that can be used to achieve some solution, right, to solve some problem. And so I think the key is to give students those tools. If we teach them what I learned in school, they're not getting the benefit of the growth in tools that are available to solve problems. And we, we've seen this over and over again. We, we hold a science fair every year, and we've seen 11th grade students, younger sometimes, literally coming up with better ways to diagnose cancer. And the only way they did that was not using a skill they had, but figuring out what skills they could employ, first learn, and then employ to solve that problem. And there's one case in particular, her name is Brittany Wenger, if you want to look her up, but she's literally a researcher now, a researcher now and, and she won the science fair one year, I think it was 2011, but literally had to learn data science, machine learning, and, and all of the tools that came along with that programming. She didn't come in knowing them. So I think when you look back, if you, if you rewind and say, well, what did she have? I think what she had was the confidence to learn and the ability to know how to learn something new, what to go look for. And I think that's the key skill. I, I don't think it's about specifically technology, but it also helps to learn the technology. Not the what buttons to press in Unity, like how do I press the right buttons and, and so I can create a simulation in three dimensions. No, it's more about when would I apply Unity? When, when is that relevant? When is it useful to, to do that to solve some problem? What are some other examples, and anyone on the panel, of problems that kids are solving? I mean, are they looking at migration patterns of frogs? Are they looking at uh, getting their local um, neighbors to recycle? How are they using technology, and what are some real cool examples? I have a great, a great one that I used myself. Uh, a couple of middle school girls wanted to figure out how to change the oil on their car turned it into a VR simulation that can that benefit so all people <laughs> who need to learn how to change oil on their car. Interesting. And they don't drive yet. They do not drive yet. Wow, they are so prepared. really future, future-minded. <laughs> uh. And uh, speaking of science fairs, I will say also in our local science fair, I saw students apl applying technology to solve certain problems. One of them that we saw was really interesting, just the simulation to show uh, the reaction time F, you know, when you're actually texting during driving. And they would sit somebody down in mm. the simulation, probably build and they would have them, you know, hand them a phone and have them text and then do it without it. An interesting problem to solve or at least a, a way to research something. I think at all ages um, you can play math games with a four-year-old and with a PhD student based on probability that they're going to affect. Uh, we create a game called Multiplication Bingo where the board is blank and so you have to decide if 24 comes up. Is it 8 times 3? three times eight, six times four, four times six, two times 12, and so on. Uh, and m much easier to learn all your multiplication tables than trying to memorize them and develop a strategy. But I, I would say seeing practical uh, examples of things is so different. And when you think about what's occurred, today I could be in an inner city in a very impoverished area, I most likely have a phone or access to a phone, and I can travel the world. I can see the entire world. I can Google and ask questions. What about this, et cetera? And so the ability of, for a teacher uh, in a program to ask students questions 
that you're not going to find the answer in the book, but you'll find it online. Even in sub-Saharan Africa today, you now have 84% penetration of mobile phones. So uh, I think the understanding that the world is available to you, regardless of your social economic status, uh, has been created by Google. And we've had programs in hundreds of schools where we let kids go on Google starting in kindergarten. So let's talk, I, I want to jump back at some point to um, the multiple and different ways to solve problems. But you touch on something really important, Mike, that um, it might be appropriate, John, for you to answer, even um, Jessica from Unity. Um, how important is the conversation about the actual technology? So should educators be really thinking about whether it's Chromebooks or mobile, or is that really not important? We should really be focusing on the content. I think for me, apparently my mic is not working, so <laughs> is this working? Yeah, this is working, okay. Um, so for me, I know you all expect me to say, oh, of course, Chromebooks is the way to go. <laughs> you must try a Chromebook. My trap. Um, and, I, and I will say there, was, there were certain things, characteristics about Chromebooks and how you could manage them that made them very successful, but it's not about, I think it's more about learning that there are different platforms and actually giving students the example of when you would use a touch device, when is it appropriate? And instead of putting a device in the student's hand and saying, this is what you will use for every problem, because that's actually, that's, that's a, the, the wrong approach. That's the lesson we should not be teaching. That, that's the lesson that says there's one hammer, uh, apply it to every, you know, everything is a nail and that's what you should hit it with. And, and so I love the idea of diversity of platform and it's one of our, you know, key cultural um, rules I would say with our, our technology is that things should work everywhere. It's hard to achieve. It's expensive. I have in some cases three teams for one app because they're trying to achieve on multiple platforms, but um, it's worth it. And I think schools should actually look for ways to introduce students to multiple platforms if they can, mm -hmm. um, or at least introduce the fact that there are other platforms that can solve problems in different ways. Isn't that great? Speaking of medical, you know, I was thinking of Jack and Draca who won the Intel science prize at ninth grade on trying to identify a way to identify uh, pancreatic cancer and earlier. Uh, but I, I would just stress the understanding. So when you talk about how to use these things, in many cases, it's a lot easier for a six-year-old to figure it out than a 50-year-old to figure out what to do naturally. Uh, but I think the goal is what does it mean rather than just get facts. And so data is so available to you today that the analysis of what does that data mean, what, what can you get out of it, how can you write a program to predict what might happen in the future from that data is really important than just getting data. And I think when you're talking about the jobs of the future, they are changing so dramatically today. I would expect uh, Google in the next 12 months to offer to read your MRIs and your CAT scans free, okay, under David Feinberg. And, and the technology of AI now allows them to read them better than any human being. And you have medical companies today that have a computer read them before the doctors do to prioritize them. So it's not, when you start thinking about jobs as to what jobs might be eliminated, it is not just jobs that have low skills. It has jobs uh, that have had high skills that now someone's doing. I would say one of the most successful things uh, we did in these after-school programs in middle schools throughout the country uh, is we found that children needed socialization and a bunch of other issues. So we, we created that you formed your own restaurant. So you had your restaurant. And you would think that 80% of the people were women or girls but we had a majority of boys, and one of the most important things they learned was to be the mater d. Okay, how to shake hands, how to greet the customers, what is customer service, where am I going to be seated? All those little challenges uh, really turned, got them interested and energized. Uh, and, but when they came out of that experience, they were much better prepared uh, for a job in sales, marketing, interacting with a customer. Uh, and, and we were quite surprised their lack of skill. So this, this technology was not going, and technology was understanding how to interact with other human beings.
And you did this as part of it, an after, it sounds like this example is part of a program. and An after-school program yeah. for middle schools, yeah. How important is it to supplement what's happening in the classroom around tech skills with after school, or dare I even say even in the home, uh, many of us are probably parents. What, what else can we do to get technical skills? And then you also touched, Mike, on some socio-emotional skills as well to supplement. Um, Jessica, do you have comment? Yeah, I mean, I think that the key thing is that learning ha is happening everywhere. There's no such thing anymore as the four walls of the classroom. And that this conversation today is how are we accelerating the learning for all young people to prepare them for the jobs of the future. One of the, the things that I, th I notice most in my global role is that in the U.S. we don't have the strength of the partnership between the corporate sector, the public sector, and the school community that we can see in other countries working. And if there's a huge ask that I think we all have here today is how do we strengthen what I call that three-legged stool to really give a strong foundation for our young people to pre prepare them for future jobs. So three-legged stool being employers, schools, and local funding, public, sec public sector yeah, exactly. access. Yeah. Some sort of funding yeah. to support it from public or private. Jonathan, you're nodding. Yeah, I, w I think the foundational changes that would be needed in school, I, w I would love to say we shouldn't need after school programs. I would love to see students be free to do the things that interest them after school, that participation in family activities and go outside, imagine that. And there's, I think it's really important though to recognize that the burden within school is still to the test. And, and if we don't change that foundational burden of first K-12 getting to the point where you can do well on a standardized test, A, to make your school look good and B, to get into a school post-secondary, you know, mm -hmm. um, then we're not going to have the time in schools to cover the tech, and therefore after-school programs are amazing ways to do it, and, and it rises, it, it, it addresses the interest of the student. It, it actually says, you know, you can choose what program. I wish we could do that in school. But I think we need foundational changes before we free up that time. And that was part of our goals with, with the tech that we were introducing, also free to schools to say, we're trying to give the teacher more time. We're trying to take away even even just efficiency and administrative burden. If we can achieve just a little bit of that, um, then we're we're at least doing some part uh, in that. For it's, many kids, however, uh, I would say after school is an extremely important time. What am I going to do after school? If you look at crime in certain areas you can see that the uh, retailers are really concerned when the middle schools or high schools let out. And by having programs after school on campus, also if I'm living in an apartment or I'm living in a homeless shelter, uh, school provides a lot of opportunities for me that I might not have otherwise. And yes, you can go outside. We created scavenger hunts where you had to solve problems, et cetera, and you're running around outside on the school grounds by using creativity. And I have to check with Unity here how we could do that better. Um, Pokemon Go. But, you know, <laughs> I, I just, um, I think it's a, a challenge today. And if you look at the U.S. versus, say, 11 Asian countries, mm. the, the number one expenditure by the middle class in Asia is food. Uh, the second expenditure is education for their child. So you have countries here, China, Korea, and others, where if you're a Korean national, you can't even go to a private school of both your parents, but 80% of the kids go to school after school or before school. And the parents allocate, in the case of the middle class in Korea, $8,000 per kid. They don't care what their housing unit looks like and those type of things. They're focused on their child. Here, uh, the middle class parent only spends 2% of their income on supplemental education and support. So unfortunately, in the U.S., most of the middle class is house poor and car poor, where they spend 50% of their income on those areas. And in Asia, they only spend 16 So you, you have a real look at examples here as to the priorities. If you go to India, to the middle class, uh, 29% expect their child to get a PhD. Now that's extremely aspirational. It's never going to happen. You know, less than 10% of people in the United States even have graduate degrees. But it, it, it's symbolic, whether you're in Indonesia, whether you're in, in countries, of what they're focused on today. 
and countries where the kid is for, the child is forced to go to government schools is where you're seeing the largest participation by the family uh, and into the education. So these are our challenges. And when you see today that three quarters of all the people under 30 in the U.S. think their life's going to be worse than their parents. You know, you have certain expectations today that we, we need to deal with. Um, if you go to China, Vietnam, Mexico, those numbers are 80 percent to 95 percent. So there is a challenge we're seeing today. And, and Mike, business. what you're bringing up is really, it's sparking something, a, a stat that um, I read, PwC did a study about technical skills. And on the higher end of concern, um, let me make sure I have 79% of CEOs are concerned about the skills shortage. 77% uh, of all jobs by next year, next year's 2020, which is kind of crazy to think. 70% um, of all jobs will require some sort of technical skills. And Mike, what you're bringing up, and John, you brought up as well, is um, the burden of what's happening in the classroom. And I use the word burden because in that same study by PwC, 10% of only 10% now, the other extreme, only 10% of teachers feel that they're equipped to be able to lead students into the, the future of work. How, how are we equipping teachers? What are we seeing? I just want to emphasize, too, that when you look at the future of work, it's not just the technical skills, mm -hmm. it's the social-emotional learning that's critical. And I think if there was one place where the educators of today can focus, it's building those social-emotional skills. I think those technical skills will continue to come along and be supported, but really prioritizing the social-emotional is where we're seeing the biggest gap okay. in the future of work. Yeah, and we, we definitely sense. feel that the training of teachers, it, it, again, it's the same trend, I think, is how to use the technology, how to apply it. It's, it's, it's comfort and confidence in using it. We, we did a study, it was actually a whole program, it was called DLP, the Dynamic Learning Program or Project, and we funded coaches for schools to see the effect of that um, on, the, on the use of technology in relevant ways by teachers. And we funded it first as, as one run in one semester and to see the value that schools saw in doing that so that teachers felt adept and confident and the ability to apply technology to problems in the teaching process um, and, and teaching those skills to students where they thought the students needed those skills. And 92% of the schools the following semester funded it themselves. Mm -hmm. So the value that they saw was tremendous. And the program, though, is very hard to scale to introduce that concept. We need to get the results of that study a little more vocal you know, and get it out there so people understand. The schools see it. And I saw it in my own school. We, I was on the board of, ed, of, of, our, of our local school when we did this, and we actually put uh, technical coaches inside the schools and we increased that program because we saw the value very quickly and it's still one of the most valued programs in the school and it's something that also gives the educators an opportunity to learn and to teach different ways and we've seen educators turn their perception around about how they can use technology in incredible ways to reach even special needs students and, and do it in, in a way that's different than they used to do it even if they've been teaching for 30 years. So it's, um, I think coaching is one of the key things. Yeah, it's almost like, it's almost like um, it, you, the teachers themselves are go coming into this coaching role on the side rather than the traditional role that they've played imparting yeah. skills and wisdom. Mike, did you have a comment? Well, for maybe 15 to 20 years, we did a state of the state um, measurement of the use of technologies in schools. With the state, all 50 state departments of education, with Education Week and others. And it was dramatically different, you know, if you look at some of the things that have happened in Tennessee uh, with many of the programs that have been implemented and all of the teachers going through what's some called the TAP program in the state, you saw that the students' performance increased more in Tennessee than others. So I'd say first there's a lot of assessment of the use of technology. It's a generational thing also. Uh, when we first started these efforts, many of the children, even at eight, knew more than the teacher. The teacher didn't want to go there. The second thing is that technology constantly broke down. Did you even have power access in the schools? You were uncomfortable teaching a lesson based on the ability to access technology or get something to work in schools, and so you didn't want to go there. Uh, but this generation of teachers coming in, uh, you know, has, when they went to school, were introduced to technology. So they feel more, when you survey them, 
they're more comfortable. Many of the elementary school teachers, however, are still not comfortable with math. And so they're, you know, you can see that they, when we look at them, they get tensed up thinking, okay, uh-oh, it's now math time, uh, et cetera, with the kids. And so to make it comfortable, one of the mistakes we made in this program um, 30 years ago is this, we empowered students with special skills, but not the teachers. So you have a little kid that can tell you that 91 times 99 is 9009 in two seconds. The teacher doesn't know what's going on, and they didn't want to go there. So we corrected that problem by first making sure all the teachers understood it. But, you know, I think we've never fully adjusted to any business where, you, whether it's nonprofit, for profit, with the skill of the individual. And... If I would have told you 40 years ago that a woman would be the CEO of IBM and a CEO of the largest defense contractor, Lockheed, and the CEO of the largest car manufacturer in the U.S., General Motors, you would have told me I am crazy. But in a different period of time, all three of them might have been teachers. Mm -hmm. And so the emancipation of women that occurred in the end of the 60s or 70s, if you went into the 60s, into the accounting firms, consulting firms, you didn't find one woman partner. Now, often the chairman of the board is a woman. So as a country, we never fully adjusted to the fact that this country was educated uh, by extremely talented women for 100 years. And so when we're going to change, we need to change compensation system, other systems that we've never fully adjusted to. Uh, that talent, etc. So there are a lot of challenges we faced, um, but as Plato said, the key to any civilization is who is educating our children. Mm. Okay, so you can want a lot of things to happen, but we can't stress the importance of this. But I just want to come back to two of the, the Unity and Google and the empowerment of the children that they've provided. But you have to empower the teachers yeah. if first. If they don't feel comfortable, they're not going to pass that on to the children. Well, we have quite a good mix in the audience of educators, of um, policymakers, uh, corporate as well. What is, we have just a few minutes left, what is a call to action? What is something that we can all do to be more, to be confident in leading students, whether they're our, our own children or future employees? Um, so have a thought about that, but John, I didn't mean to cut you off, so if you had a comment. No. No? Okay. Would you like to answer the, <laughs> the last question then? <laughs> I mean, I do think... A call to action. Yeah, I do think one call to action for sure is to um, to test the school, you know, to, to, to put pressure on the school if you don't think that they're teaching the things that you feel your student needs to learn. I really think that, you know, I regret not advocating enough for my own students, and they're still in the system, so yeah. I, I try, but it's... And those things aren't just tech. It's no, not it's just not. machine learning and data science. It's also what? No, it's actually, it's, again, how to learn. And that's the, if somebody is learning a skill, whether it's a, a young student or an adult, and they don't know when they're going to apply it or why they're learning it, I got a lot of shade for asking, I think the New York Times gave me a lot of shade for asking, like not being able to answer my student when he asked my son, why am I learning the quadratic equation? And my answer was, ask your teacher. I don't know why you're learning the quadratic equation. I don't know when you would apply it. Ask your teacher. And I think that's what we can do. The call to action is to give your schools the impetus to teach your students how to learn, not just to regurgitate facts. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we, we've learned, you know, two plus two equals four. That's undisputable. However, there are lots of ways to get to four. Maybe we make a bigger number. You know, there's lots of ways to get to 88, um, which isn't just 80 plus eight. And so would you also recommend having students think about problems in a new way, think about what they're learning in a new way? Are schools already doing that? I think to a certain degree, um, you can see the change. If you go to Mount Vernon today, they have a program there where you sit in a room, they call it a classroom, with tablets, and George Washington describes his problems. You see an actor as George Washington, and then ask you what you would do. Now, that's a pretty interesting way to learn about the Revolutionary War and things than just reading about what happened. And so the engagement that exists today, any student in, can go to NASA today if you want to learn about things. 
yeah. you might be able to go physically, but you can go digitally today. And so I, I, mean, I think we have to focus on, the, on these issues. Uh, but the future, when I travel to countries, maybe 30 a year, I always visit their elementary schools because the future of that country mm -hmm. is in those classrooms and you could see uh, what the challenges are and not. But I think the other part is to motivate educators. Uh, we started this Educator Award a long time ago, National Educator Award, to really uplift the image of the profession by the profession itself. Uh, and Jessica, we're, we're going we're gonna to close on you. I opened with you. I'm going to close on you. And I, I want to go to NASA using uh, VR, AR. Talk to us a little bit. What's one call to action? Yeah, I think, the, I think the key call to action is we have got to build the future in diverse communities, communities of color, for high-skilled labor. We can no longer allow for us to be focusing only on certain communities. So how do we, how do we invest in communities of color to create high-skilled labor opportunities for them? Thank you. It's a, it's a powerful question to end on. I wish we didn't have to end there. So that's our homework to think about. Thank you so much, Mike, John, Jessica, for joining us. And I'll turn it back to Romaine. Thank you so much.